So one of the most difficult aspects of being a Christian is the fact that we are called to be in the world, but not of the world. Okay, this is our calling. We are called to be in the world, but not of the world. And if you have been a Christian for any length of time, you know that there is nothing easy about this. Do I hear an amen on that? There is nothing easy about this. I've been a Christian for 35 years, and I'm telling you, where to draw the line with being in the world and of the world probably comes up in my own life 10 times a day, 20 times a day, where I'm like, okay, where is the line? Where is the line? And as our culture drifts further and further into a moral abyss, the challenge of being in the world and not of the world is only growing more difficult. I mean, we are headed down a cliff in this country, and so we as Christians now are faced with just questions that the previous generation didn't even have to deal with at all. Um, so we are in a unique situation. And if you're a Christian who is serious about living out your faith, you will have to make some very important, very tough decisions in the days, weeks, and years ahead. You're not only gonna have to make them in the days, weeks, and years ahead, you're gonna sometimes have to make them every hour of every day. Um, that is the world that we live in with regard to this issue that's gonna be pressing. Now, let me give you an example of where Christians are having to deal with this. I have talked to Christians in this church who work for either the state or federal government and are feeling immense pressure coming from the whole social justice movement. The social justice movement has now infiltrated and even taken over certain aspects of our government. And many Christians, even in this congregation here, are being told to take a knee or take a hike. They're being told to get woke or lose your job. Get woke and go broke, there's your choice. Take a knee, take a hike, get woke or go broke. But it's not just Christians that are working for government, it's Christians in the private sector as well. They're feeling immense pressure too. If you've been watching the news, you know that Christian business owners are struggling with where to draw the line when it comes to running a Christian business in the world, but being a Christian business that is not of the world. And Christian business owners are now being taken to court quite frequently as a result of their trying to run their businesses by their Christian convictions. Now these are just a couple of examples, a couple of the places where Christians are having to deal with this issue. The fact of the matter is there's a thousand more examples that we could give. And I bet right now, in a room this size with this many people or with the people that are watching online, some of you, this is an issue you're dealing with, it's front and center in your life right now. You are dealing with this issue of how do I remain in the world but not of the world because you are faced with a very difficult question, that very difficult circumstance, and this message is for you. As I said earlier, there's nothing easy about it. It'll be one of the toughest tasks that we will face. So, so that we're all on the same page, I wanna briefly, I wanna briefly look at just how serious God is in wanting you and I to be in this world, but not of this world. What is so interesting about this is that God actually called an entire nation to be in the world and not of the world. And the nation that I'm talking about is the nation of Israel in the Old Testament. Israel was to be a holy nation set apart Set apart from all the other nations around them, God said, you are my people, you are my chosen people. Be holy, because I am holy. And you wanna know just how serious God was that the nation of Israel be a holy nation? After delivering the nation of Israel out of 400 years in slavery, in Egypt, they were in Egypt, 400 years in Egypt, Moses leads them out, and he leads them up to the plains of Moab, which is just east of the Jordan River. And there Moses tells the Israelites exactly what they are to do when they enter the promised land. Now remember, Moses dies, and who takes over? Joshua, right? Joshua takes over. But before Moses dies, this is what he tells the Israelites to do. Now listen, I'm going to read to you one of the most shocking passages in all the Bible, so brace yourselves. This is a passage that is so shocking that unbelievers will go right to it to try to assault the Christian faith or the Judeo-Christian faith. Um, they will go straight to this passage. It's in Deuteronomy chapter 20. Church, I present to you the word of God today. But in the cities of these people that the Lord your God is giving you for an inheritance, you shall save alive nothing that breathes, but you shall devote them to complete destruction, the Hittites and the Amorites and the Canaanites and the Perizzites, 
the Hivites and the Jezubites, as the Lord your God has commanded you. And why is he commanding them to do this? Here's why. That they may not teach you to do according to all their abominable practices that they have done for their gods. And so you, so, and so you sin against the Lord your God. Again, many people are often shocked when reading this passage that God would command blood to be shed simply to ensure that the nation of Israel be pure and holy. But that is exactly what he does. And by the way, if you think it's unfair what God has done here, why did God send the, the, the Israelites down to Egypt for 400 years? The Old Testament says, so that the sins of the Amorites might reach their fullest. He's bringing judgment on the people in the land. He's bringing judgment on them. And he's using the Israelites to do it. But he's doing more than that. He's doing it to keep them as a pure and holy people, set apart from the world around them. Again, many people are shocked when reading this passage that God would command blood to be shed simply to ensure the nation of Israel be pure and holy. But folks, that should give us incredible insight to just how serious this issue is that you and I be a people set apart in this world. We are in the world, but not to be of it in any way, shape, or form. How serious does God take it? This serious. This serious. And if the idea of God shedding blood in order to set a people apart unto himself sounds even remotely familiar, it should. <laughs> it's called the gospel. The gospel. Listen, if God shedding this blood shocks you, here's what's even more shocking. God sent his one and only sinless son from the glories of heaven to come to earth to take on human flesh, to be beaten and mocked and humiliated, to have his beard ripped out, to have a, thorn of, uh, a crown of thorns shoved on his head to be flogged and to be crucified on a tree as a criminal. The gospel is all about the sinless son of God shedding his blood in order to redeem a people who would be set apart, a group of priests who sing his praises, as Peter says in chapter two of his epistle. As you come to him, a living stone rejected by men, but in the sight of God chosen and precious, you yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Do you realize what we just did in this congregation? All of us, as we sang these songs and we worshiped with those that led us up here, we offered, we, became, we are a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, and we offered spiritual sacrifices to God with our voices. When I first became a Christian, I marveled at the fact, I said, God, I, I mean, I became, I was born again. I got born again at 17, the well, lights came on, and I was like, oh, I can't believe it. And I marveled that I could use my voice to praise God. I was this young kid, and I'm like, Lord, you created this voice, and now I'm using it to worship you. It was amazing. Now back to the nation of Israel. As some of you might remember, Israel did not fully rid the land of the people inhabiting it as they were commanded to do. And as a result, the worst case scenario happened. And by the way, side note, do you want to know what worst case scenario is? Worst case scenario isn't that the wrong person or the wrong politician is in, in, in some office. The worst case scenario isn't that our economy goes south. The worst case scenario is always, always that the people of God be corrupted. The worst case scenario for your family isn't somebody losing their job or even someone getting sick. It is your family being corrupted by the world. And as Christians, I think sometimes we lose sight of that. We're all in here going, well, what's worst case scenario? What's gonna happen to this country? That's an important question, and I'm not saying that we shouldn't labor and pray for this country. As a matter of fact, we just sang a song, right? What did we sing? Build your kingdom here. Let the darkness fear, show your mighty hand. Heal our streets and land. Set your church on fire. Build your kingdom here, we pray. We want good things for this country. But listen, worst case scenario isn't that this country goes south. Worst case scenario is the church goes south and that Christians go south. Amen. Worst case scenario started happening in Israel. The Israelites began to adopt the practices of the nations around them. Do you know what's interesting? Is that the Israelites, after they had entered the land, they conquered it, they didn't drive everybody out, but they stayed in the land for 400 years and they were governed or ruled by 
Judges, that's the book of Judges. So Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, Ruth, um, and, and so that's where Judges come in. It's this 400 year period where they conquered the land and they're in it. But at the end of the 400 years of being ruled by Judges, what does the nation do? They look at all the nations around them and they go, hey, the, all the nations around us have kings. We should have a king. That's a great idea. Yeah, I don't know whoever came up with that idea. <laughs> Poor guy or girl, whoever that was. It's a horrible idea. And God warned them, you do not want a king. If I give you a king, he's going to tax you. And he is going to ten, send your sons off to war. These are the consequences if I give you a king like the nations around you. Who was the king of Israel? God was. And they wanted to trade in God leading them and protecting them for what the world had. And so God did that, right? And who was the first king? Saul. The second king? David. And the third king was Solomon. So Saul, David, Solomon. They each reigned 40 years, right around 40 years. So Saul, David, Solomon. You can remember that. And um, Solomon, um, well, he got influenced by the world. <laughs> the worst case scenario began to happen with Solomon. David, his father, was a man after God's own heart. He had his flaws, but he, had, he was a man after God's own heart. But then we read this about Solomon. He had 700 wives. <laughs> <laughs> Enough said. <laughs> Enough said. He had 700 wives who were princesses. How many princesses can you have? Can you imagine, like, you're a princess. Well, you're a princess, too. Well, you're a princess, too. You'd think after a while they'd go, oh, he says that to everybody. <laughs> he had 700 wives who were princesses and 300 concubines. Now listen to this, worst case scenario, guys. I, enter, I interject levity because of the seriousness of this topic, but here's the seriousness of this topic hitting us right again. And his wives turned away his heart, for when Solomon was old, his wives turned away his heart after other gods. And his heart was not wholly true to the Lord his God, as was the heart of David his father. For Solomon went after Ashtoreth, the goddess of the Sidonians, and after Milcom, the abomination of the Ammonites. So Solomon did what was evil in the sight of the Lord, and did not wholly follow the Lord as David his father had done. Then Solomon built high places for Chemosh, the abomination of Moab, and for Molech, the abomination of the Ammonites, on the mountains east of Jerusalem. And so he did for all his foreign wives who made offerings and sacrifice to their God. See, it wasn't just that Solomon had 700 wives. It's that he had foreign wives. Exactly what God didn't want to happen, that they would intermix, that the Israelites would intermix with the people of this world and then be influenced by them. That's exactly what happened. And by the way, look right there in verse 7 at the very end, on the mountains east of Jerusalem. So there's a verse in the book of Psalms that says, I lift my eyes up to the heavens. I lift my eyes up to the mountains. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord God, the maker of heaven and earth. We, there's a song, too. It goes, I lift my eyes up unto the mountains. Where does my help come from? Right? My help comes from the Lord God, maker of heaven and earth. And the point is, is that the, the, the psalmist very well may have had this in mind, that do I, when I'm in time of desperation and need, I lift my eyes up and I see the high places where they're sacrificing to the false gods. Does my help come from there? No. No, my help doesn't come from those high places. My help comes from the Lord God, the maker of heaven and earth. Amen? Amen? Do you want another example of just how seriously God takes this issue of his people being in the world and not of the world? After Solomon died, so here's what happened. After Solomon died, um, there was going to be a king, his king, the king's name, the next king was going to be named Rehoboam. And they said to Rehoboam, your dad taxed us, or yeah, he, your dad taxed us way too much, lighten the load because it was just too much for us. And so he goes to his buddies and say, hey, I'm going to be king, should I lighten the load? And what do his friends say? No. Let's party. No, we want to party. And so he goes back to the people and he goes, I'm going to make it, I'm going to tax you even more. 
And so the nation splits. The nation splits over this. And so there's a king, Jeroboam, re re ruling over half of them, and Rehoboam's ruling over the other half of the nation. They, there's literally like a civil war, kind of like what we feel is happening in this country, right? So they split, and now there's two kings of Israel. That's why when you read First and Second Kings, it says, so it goes, Saul, David, Solomon. But it gets confusing in First and Second Kings and First and Second Chronicles after that because it says so-and-so was the king of Israel, and so-and-so was the king of Judah. So-and-so was the king of Israel, and so-and-so was the king of Judah. That's why. That's why there were so many kings. But here's the kicker. Of the 49 kings after Solomon, before the Babylonians came down and destroyed them in the, in, around the year 500, of the 49 kings after Solomon, only eight of them were good. Only eight of them were good. So Saul, David, and Solomon reigned right around 1,000 years before Christ. But of the 49 kings after, leading up to around the year 570, when Babylon came down and destroyed them, there was 49 kings reigning in Israel at one point or another. Only eight of them were good. 41 out of the 49 were bad. Wow. So why is that important? Here's why it's important. The Jewish people, as a result of these corrupt kings, were often mired in adult, uh, idolatry. So let me ask you a question. Does leadership matter? You're darn right it does. It darn right it does. The Jewish people were often mired in idolatry and practicing the detestable things of the nations around them. What did God do as a result? Well, nothing too drastic. Other than the fact that he raised up the Babylonian Empire to come down and wipe out everything in their path, taking the nation of Israel off into exile for 70 years. That's all. You want to know how serious God takes the issue of us being in the world but not of the world? That seriously. That seriously. Enough that when the Israelites came up out of Egypt, he said, wipe out everything and everyone in the land. Get them out. I'm bringing judgment upon them, and I'm going to keep you pure. How much does God take, seriously take this issue? So much so that he rouses a nation from the north to come down and wipe out everything in their path and take the nation of Israel off into exile for 70 years. That, my friends, is how serious God takes the issue of being in the world, but not of the world. Just how seriously does God take the issue of his people being in the world and not of the world? Well, seriously enough that in Jesus' high priestly prayer, the high priestly prayer in John 17, one of the most beautiful prayers ever prayed, Jesus intercedes for his people, intercedes for his church, those that God has given him out of the world, praying for his disciples and those that would come after them. Jesus specifically prays over this very issue. I have given them your word, Jesus says, he's praying, and the world has hated them because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. How seriously does God take this issue? Seriously enough that when Jesus intercedes before his crucifixion for his disciples and for those that are his, he intercedes over this very issue that they could be a people that would be in the world but not of the world. You want to know what else is so interesting about this particular prayer? It's not only how serious Jesus takes the issue, we're also reminded how serious the enemy takes the issue. See, Jesus knew that the enemy wants to, above all things, corrupt the church, corrupt Christians. Governments come and go. I don't know that Satan is worried about all the, the, the stuff, the worldly stuff that's happening in the world, but I do know this. He wants to corrupt the church. That's high on his priority list. It's way up there. And it's not just the church. I mean you and me. On the top of Satan's priority list is your corruption, is my corruption. This is what he wants. Listen, if God takes it seriously, if Christ takes it seriously, if Satan takes it seriously, then you and I would be wise to take this issue seriously of being in the world but not of the world. And so we're going to spend this week and next dealing with this issue. And don't miss next week. <laughs> I'm, hitting hard this, I'm hitting hard today. You're going to see where we're going to go with this, but don't miss next week, I'm telling you. So here's where we're going to go today. One of the most important issues that we have to address concerning this subject of being in the world but not of the world is our relationship with unbelievers. What sort of relationship am I to have with unbelievers in this world? I mean, for heaven's sakes, we as Christians are the minority in this world, are we not? 
um, there's seven, maybe eight billion people, close to eight billion people on the planet. They say roughly 1.5, 1.7 billion people claim to be Christian, and that's everybody. We know for a fact that the amount of true born again believers is much smaller than that. You and I are in a world where we are the minority, and we are going to be encountering non believers a hundred times a day, a thousand times a day, 10,000 times a month, you are gonna be interacting with non-believers and so am I. So the question is, how to remain in the world but not of the world when we're interacting with people who don't know the Lord? So for example, is it okay for me to be in business with a non-believer? Is it okay for me to marry a non-believer? Is it okay for me to partner with non-believers in addressing social issues like homelessness and hunger? Is it okay to partner with non-believers with regard to political issues? What about those in my own family who aren't believers? How do I interact with them at Christmas and at Easter? What's my relationship to be with them? These are tough questions, you guys. These are really tough questions. Where do we draw the line when it comes to these issues? I'm glad you asked. Because <laughs> that's where we're going to go. So one of the primary passages that deals with this very issue was written by the Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 6. Again, church. It's my honor to present to you the word of God today. Do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. For what partnership has righteousness with lawlessness? Or what fellowship has light with darkness? What accord has Christ with Belial? Or what portion does a believer have with an unbeliever? What agreement has the temple of God with idols? For we are the temple of the living God. As God said, I will make my dwelling among them and walk among them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Therefore, go out from their midst and separate from them, says the Lord, and touch no unclean thing. Then I will welcome you, and I will be as a father, I will be as a father to you, and you shall be sons and daughters to me says the Lord Almighty. Amen. Again, church, I present to you the word. So the Apostle Paul draws an analogy from the Old Testament. And so in Deuteronomy chapter 22, we read this, you shall not plow with an ox and a donkey together. Now that's a really strange command in the Old Testament. Why would God care if the Israelites had a donkey and an ox uh, in the same yoke? A yoke is that thing that goes over their neck right there. You guys know what a yoke is. Why would God care about that? Here's why. I think it's God sending a message. Remember, everything in the Old Testament is a shadow or a type found in Christ. Uh, it's, it finds its fulfill, fulfillment in Christ. And so I think God, in giving this command, it was a practical command to remind them, just as I don't want you to yoke these two animals together, you don't yoke yourself together with the world. Amen? Every time you strap the animals together, it will be a powerful reminder to you, you are not to do this. Yoke two things together that shouldn't be together. Because what happens when you yoke two things that shouldn't be together and you do yoke them together if, if you're a farmer? Yeah, you don't plow a straight line, right? Anybody know what that is, by the way? The plow line? Furrow. It's called a furrow. I remember that. I had to look it up, but yeah, it's called a furrow. But here's the point, you guys. What are we called to do? Broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many are on it. Narrow is the road that leads to life, and few find it. If you had found that narrow road, the last thing you want to do is yoke yourself together with somebody who's going to pull you off it, who's going to prevent you or ha cause you to stumble as you try to walk faithfully on it. It's hard enough to walk that narrow road and to be faithful. The last thing we need is somebody pulling us off of it. So that's why this is so important. The so passage clearly states, it's literally the difference. Do you understand the difference, the spiritual difference between a believer and a non-believer? Do you understand how wide the gap is between a believer and an unbeliever? Well, in case you missed it, let me reemphasize it. It is literally, according to our passage, the difference between righteousness and unrighteousness, lightness, light and darkness, Christ and Satan, the temple of God and the temple of idols. Folks, you can never in your wildest imagination create a further distance between the, the distance that exists between believers and unbelievers. That distance, folks, do all you can to keep it out there because as much as you push them apart, it should be even further than that. And just as I always say in this church, you keep God up here and you keep man down here. Whatever you do, don't say God's kind of good and I'm not so bad. You keep that distance here. 
God, is, God exists in unapproachable light, and you and I are but creatures. The Bible describes us as grasshoppers. In the same way that you do that, turn it this way, and you, the spiritual, the born-again person, are worlds apart from them that are not born again. And we're not casting stones over there because it's only by God's grace that we're over here, right? But the distance there, never lose sight of the distance that's there, guys. Ever. Because what happens is we go, well, we got a lot in common. Oh, you believe in God? I believe in God too. And before we know it, we're yoked with somebody who doesn't believe in the God that we believe in or doesn't believe in the gospel that we believe in. And that, for example, let's, a let's answer one question right off the bat. That is, should a, should a non-believer, should a believer and a non-believer marry? I would say absolutely not. Marriage is a sacred institution that comes loaded with massive spiritual implications. Massive spiritual implications. And if you're here today, here's the bearing it has on you. Guard your children and your grandchildren. Guard your children and grandchildren that are Christians. Because oftentimes when they bring that boyfriend or girlfriend home, what's the first question we're tempted to ask? Do you have a job? <laughs> right? What's your job? What do you do? How much money do you make? Do you come from a wealthy family? Don't judge me. You all do the same. <laughs> Listen, those are not the most important questions. The most important question is, do you know the Lord? Do you love him? Are you truly born again? Are you part of the family? Not the physical family, the spiritual family. This is the most important thing. Remember, I told you, we as Christians can lose sight of what's truly important. Worst case scenario isn't that Washington is off the chain, or that our economy might be going down the tubes, or that my family might be in disarray. The worst case scenario is always corruption has come to the church. Corruption has come into the lives of Christians. Corruption has come into my family. That's worst case scenario. All the time, every time. Amen. All the time, every time. Yeah. Folks, there is absolutely no spiritual common ground whatsoever between believers and non-believers. Absolutely none. Spiritually speaking, there's none. You have nothing in common with those that are spiritually dead. And I know you're going, Bill, you're beating a dead horse to death. But I'm doing it because we cannot lose sight, folks, of what is at stake. When God calls us to be in the world but not of the world, folks, he is dead serious. And I mean dead serious about it. He has shed a lot of blood to make sure that his people be a pure and holy people down through the centuries. This is precisely why the ecumenical movement that has sweep, swept over in the last 30 years, swept through the church and swept over our land, the ecumenical movement is so dangerous. It's that call for churches and denominations and Christians just to come together in the name of unity. Can't we just all get along? Yeah, the answer is no. We cannot. Listen, just because someone calls themselves a Christian or an organization labels themselves as a church or they say they believe in God, folks, that doesn't mean anything. I hope you realize that. That means nothing. You all know, and I, as well as I know, Satan masquerades as what? An angel of light. Which means that if not extremely careful, a believer can easily yoke themselves together with someone who is only masquerading as a brother and sister of Christ. And I say it happens all the time in marriage. I said, that's why I say guard your children and your grandchildren. You think I'd never yoke myself together with an unbeliever. You will if you don't guard your family. There are many, <laughs> I'll just speak for the men here. Men will say whatever they have to do to get the date. <laughs> including, I'm a Christian. You need me to be a Christian? I'm a Christian. We, all the women are like, yeah, I know, yeah, right. Men will say what they, they will act how they need to act and do what they need to do and say what they need to say if they think they're going to get the girl of their dreams, including pretending to be a Christian. Please don't let the significance of this be lost on you. Spiritually dead people can easily slip into the church, slip into our lives, slip into our families, and before we are yoked together with them spiritually. We see this happening in the first century church, by the way. For certain people have crept in unnoticed. It was already happening in the first century church while the apostles are standing guard. The apostles are standing guard over the church, and it's already happening. Who long ago were designated for this condemnation, ungodly people who pervert the grace of our God into sensuality and deny our only master and Lord Jesus Christ. Now, it says that they are ungodly people, right, who pervert the, the, the grace of our Lord. They pervert the gospel. You go, well, they should be pretty easy to spot, right? What does Matthew chapter 7 say? 
Many will come to me on that day and say, Lord, Lord, didn't we do miracles in your name? And didn't we drive out demons in your name? And didn't we do this, that, and the other thing in your name? And what is he going to say? Depart from me, you evildoers. I do not know you. Those that want to yoke, yoke themselves together with you are often will come in the name of religion, will come in the name of Christ, will pretend to be a believer, will, will be masquerading as an angel of light when they are anything but. Let me give you a really good example of what has happened. You've seen it over the last year and a half with what has transpired in the church across America. The church has become infected with critical race theory and the social justice movement. Why? Because people espousing to be believers and coming in the name of truth crept into the church and in no time flat, what did they do? They changed the gospel of Jesus Christ. It was replaced. As a result, the gospel was no longer about the sinless son of God dying on the cross to free men from the penalty and power of sin. It was now about Jesus setting an example as a first century activist to free people from racial and social injustice. And that should be our cause today. That's not the gospel, folks. But it has crept into churches all across this nation. It has crept in and corrupted the gospel. And folks, there's nothing new under the sun. You do realize this. This has been happening in the church. I can, let's just go back 50 years. It started with the prosperity teachers, right? These false teachers crept into the church 30, 40, 50 years ago. And they slowly changed the gospel from one in which we count the cost, die to self, and give our lives away in service to our Savior, to one in which there is no cost, and the ultimate goal is for you to experience your best life now. God wants to give you health, wealth, and happiness. This is the gospel. Is that the gospel? It is not the gospel. The gospel is a call to surrender to Christ, to come to him as your Savior and Lord, and to give your life away in service to him in this lifetime. No greater love than this than when one man lays his life down for another, that we are a people who have counted the cost and we do not cling to this world. We gladly surrender all for our king and serve him with all of our hearts. That's the heart of the gospel. A people that have surrendered to Christ as Savior and are serving him as Lord in this generation. You do understand that's why the Protestant reformers did what they did. That is precisely why the Protestant reformers 500 years ago broke away from the Catholic Church in the 16th century. One of the hallmarks of the Protestant Reformation was a Latin phrase, lex tenebram lux, after the darkness, light. After coming out of the dark ages, the middle ages, light shed upon the church again as the gospel, as the reformers found the gospel and began to proclaim it with all of their heart. They began to preach great, that we are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. A gospel which was officially condemned by the Catholic Church at the Council of Trent in 1545. Now, I do not, I do not say that to condemn Catholics here. Don't, don't get me wrong at all. As a matter of fact, I'm going to give credit to that generation on both sides of the debate. Both Catholics and Protestants living 500 years ago clearly understood, I mean, both sides meticulously understood to their credit what so many Catholics and Protestants fail to see today, and it is this. If we cannot agree upon the gospel, we cannot and should not be yoked together spiritually in any way, shape, or form. And I hope I get an amen for that. You do understand that you're at a Protestant church that believes that we are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, and Christ alone. That is radically different from the gospel that is preached in Catholic, church, Catholic churches, in which you are saved by grace, yes, through faith, yes. But... You must be baptized, that increase, increases your justification, and you do penance, and that increases your justification, and you lead a life of good works, and that increases your justification, and hopefully by the end of your life, you've lived a good enough life to go straight to heaven, because if you don't, you'll go to purgatory. Folks, that is not the gospel. And I don't say that to condemn any Catholics. If you're here today, don't understand my heart. I just want us to see the differences. I just want to see the differences. We are either saved by grace alone, through faith alone, or we are not. But if we are, that's a dividing line. That is where we draw the line. And so we can sum up this whole idea of not being yoked together with unbelievers this way, or at least to this point, I gotta keep an eye on the time. Under no circumstances must we ever yoke ourselves together with unbelievers with regard to spiritual matters. Now, I'm, I'm out of time. Can I go for five more minutes? Yeah. Okay, I gotta finish. Otherwise, we're gonna go to next week and this is gonna be a three-weeker. 
this naturally raises the question, what is to be my relationship with, if I'm not to be yoked together with uh, unbelievers on spiritual matters, what about temporal earthly matters? Well, we get some insight here from Paul in Corinthians. I wrote to you in my letter, it's a letter that we don't have anymore, but I wrote to you in my letter not to associate with sexually immoral people. Not at all meaning the sexually immoral of the world or the greedy or the swindlers or the idolaters. Since then, you'd have to be out of the world. But now I am writing, what I really meant to say was to you is not to associate with anyone who bears the name of brother if he is guilty of sexual immorality or is greedy or is an idolater or vile or drunkard, swindler. Don't even eat with such a person. So Paul's saying it's, it's the Christians, the people in the name of Christ who are living immoral, separate, don't even associate with them, don't even break bread with them. But the people of this world, of course you're going to have to associate with them, the non-believers. It's impossible. Otherwise, you'd have to be taken out of this world. So while Christians are called to separate themselves from non-believers when it comes to spiritual eternal matters, there's no need to necessarily isolate ourselves from non-believers when it comes to temporal worldly matters. John MacArthur, one of my favorite theologians and pastors, says it this way. Consequently, relationships between believers and unbelievers are at best limited to temporal and external. They may enjoy family ties, work at the same job, share in business relationships, live in the same community, experience same hobbies and pastimes, and even agree on certain political and social issues. But on a spiritual level, believers and unbelievers live in two completely different worlds. So with all that being said, we can answer the question, where do we draw the line? Well, I would say it looks something like this. Christians are to be completely separate from non-believers on spiritual matters and use great caution with non-believers on all other matters. Amen? Fair? Hopefully I did a good job of summarizing where to draw the line. Christians are to be completely separate from non-believers on spiritual matters. Use great caution with non-believers on all other matters. I finish with a challenge, and the challenge is this. Ask God to give you great discernment as you walk that fine line of being in the world but not of the world. Amen? Amen. Don't miss next week. I promise. Don't miss it. Let me pray. Father in heaven, as we leave, God, may we leave as a people who have been called to remain in this world, to be salt and light to this world, to love the world, to love those that don't know you, to reach out and build bridges and to share the gospel and to invite them into the kingdom that we've been invited into. But God, at that same time, protect us, keep us pure, keep our families pure, help us to diligently, God, watch over our families and our businesses and our churches, God, that we would truly remain a people set apart, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people devoted to you, singing the praises of your excellency day in and day out. We love you. We thank you. We pray these things in Christ's name. Everybody say it with me. Amen. Amen. God bless you. You guys have a great day. We'll see you right here next week. Yeah.